If you ask a person on the street to explain what abstract algebra is, they might say that it is something horrible that has to do with X, Y, and Z. Well, in order to answer this question, we'll explore eight discoveries that built on one another, without which modern abstract algebra would be impossible. We'll start out with some obvious mathematical concepts, but it will gradually build up to more complex subjects, and most importantly, to how we got to the abstract algebra we know nowadays. There are certain things which are intuitive to us, like the natural numbers. They come with two very natural operations, addition and multiplication. So what can we do with them? All kinds of ancient mathematicians like to play around with natural numbers and their operations. But we'll skip forward to Diophantus of Alexandria and his Diophantine equations. Diophantine equations first appeared in his published work Arithmetica. The simplest linear Diophantine equation takes this form, ax plus by equals c. This is actually very hard to solve just with the tools that Diophantus had, which was basically natural numbers and simple arithmetics. No negative numbers or zeros. Plus, instead of using numbers and signs, ancient mathematicians would write out entire sentences, known as rhetoric algebra. One way he would have thought about equations was through using geometry. Finding all right triangles with integer side lengths is the same as solving the Diophantine equation a squared plus b squared equals c squared, also known as Pythagorean triplets. To find a solution, Diophantus would focus on finding integer values of a, b, and c that satisfy the equation without calculating square roots. A classic method known to mathematicians of later periods, but possible in an early form for Diophantus, is to express the sides in terms of two parameters, m and n. He would do it by trial and error, essentially just plugging in random numbers. Let's pick m equals 2 and n equals 1. With these values, we see that 3, 4, and 5 form a valid solution to the equation a squared plus b squared equals c squared, without the need to calculate square roots. Defentus would not typically provide a general solution or formula. Instead, he would demonstrate a specific example that works. Now, there were various geometric ways mathematicians thought about numbers, just like Defentus thought of the triangle. Visually speaking, we know we can count forward on and on. But what happens when we try to count backwards? This leads us to integers, which not only include positive numbers, but also zero and negative numbers. The zero plays a crucial role. Similar placeholders to the zero were used by various ancient civilizations, but it wasn't until the 7th century when it was formalized in the decimal place value by Indian mathematician Brahmagupta. Although there are signs that other Indian mathematicians might have started using it in the same way a few centuries earlier, with zeros and the predecessor for polynomial equations set up by Diophantus, Persian mathematician Al-Khwarizmi introduced what we now know as the origins of modern algebra. In his work, The Compendious Book on Calculation by Completion and Balancing, al khwarizmi would deal with equations of the form ax squared equals bx and ax squared plus c equals bx, but still using rhetoric algebra. Say we want to solve the equation 3x plus 5 equals 17. al khwarizmis method involved reducing the equation to a simpler form by eliminating constants from one side. He would subtract the constant term from both sides of the equation to balance them. This simplifies to 3x equals 12. The next step is obvious, resulting in 4. The method was revolutionary, because it showed a way to solve equations in a systematic way, not for specific case scenarios, as was the standard for all equations before. We won't delve into all of it here, but we have another video discussing it in detail. Link in the description. Al Khwarizmi's methods dealt effectively with linear and quadratic equations. But even these could lead to results that fell outside of the realm of whole numbers and made the use of fractions necessary. For example, solving the equation 2x equals 1 within the integers is impossible. So, rational numbers were introduced. Yes, al khwarizmi and ancient mathematicians before him had an idea of rational numbers, but they weren't formalized until the medieval age. Rational numbers include all fractions where the numerator, the top number, and the denominator, the bottom number, are integers, and the denominator is not zero. But remember, these are still being expressed in words and entire sentences, which is pretty uncomfortable. 
It was in the Middle Ages that François Viette, a French mathematician in the late 16th century, systematically used letters to represent both known and unknown quantities in equations. Viette introduced the convention of using consonants to represent known parameters and vowels to represent unknowns. Consider one of Viette's examples involving the area of a triangle. Before Viette, the problem might have been described to using entire sentences. Viette instead expressed the area of a triangle as a function of its base and height using the formula 1 over 2 times the base times height. In this expression, a, b and h could represent any numbers, allowing the formula to be applied universally rather than needing a specific example each time. His notational system was directly adopted and refined by René Descartes, who introduced the modern notation of using x, y, and z for unknowns and letters a, b, and c for known coefficients. René Descartes' major contribution was the development of analytical geometry, a bridge between algebra and geometry, which he introduced in his work La Geometrie in 1637. By using the Cartesian coordinate system, Descartes was able to represent polynomial equations as geometric curves. This is where we get into the roots of polynomial equations. Descartes introduced something called Descartes' rule of signs which is a mathematical rule used to determine the number of positive and negative real roots of a polynomial equation, based on the sign changes in its coefficients. Say we want to determine the number of positive and negative real roots of this polynomial. Descartes' rule of signs says that we need to count the sign change between consecutive terms. The concept of sign change refers to the transition between positive and negative coefficients. Start by writing down the coefficients of the polynomial. One, minus 6, 11, minus 6. Now, observe the signs, plus, minus, plus, minus. A sign change occurs when you move from a positive coefficient to a negative one, or vice versa. The first sign change happens between plus 1 and minus 6. The second sign change happens between plus 11 and minus 6. Hence, there are two sign changes in P of X, which according to Descartes' rule of signs indicates that there can be up to two positive real roots. Ah. And by the way, Isaac Newton also brought his own approach to find roots, known as newton refson method. It's a bit more complicated. The core idea of Newton's method is to start with an initial guess for the root, say x0, and then improve this guess iteratively using this formula. Meaning that you start with an initial guess, an estimate, for the root of a function, and then you repeatedly apply a specific formula to get you closer and closer to the actual root. Here, p of xn is the value of the polynomial at the point xn. p prime of xn is the value of the derivative of the polynomial at xn. xn plus 1 is the next estimate of the root, hopefully an improved version of it. The final step in Newton's method is to compute the derivative of the polynomial. We won't compute all of it, just the final result. Its derivative is this, 3x squared minus 12x plus 11. In this example, we start with an initial guess of x0 equals to 2.5. How would Newton know to start with 2.5? Well, he wouldn't. It's just a guess. He might also use some previously known methods, such as synthetic division, rough trials, or approximate linearizations. Now we need to calculate the value of the polynomial and its derivative at x0 equals to 2.5. Update x using the newton refson formula. And we get this. So after the first iteration, our updated estimate of the root is x1 approximately 2.6364. To get closer to the exact root, you would repeat the process using x1 equals to 2.6364 as the new guess, and then calculate p of x1 and p prime of x1. And this way you would get x2, and so on, you continue the process. But here's why they were limited. When we speak of equations to the degree 3 and higher, Newton and Descartes didn't delve in too deeply. But it was Evaris Galois who introduced the concept of solvability by radicals for polynomial equations. Polynomial equations for higher degrees are inherently complicated. So Galois theory examines how roots of a polynomial are related to each other through symmetrical operations. These relationships or permutations of the roots abide by four fundamental properties of a group. A group is an algebraic structure consisting of a set of elements or a well-defined collection of objects. Closure. For any two elements a and b in the group, the result of the operation a times b is also in the group. 
associativity. For all A, B and C in the group, the result of A times B times C is the same as A times the result of B times C. Identity element. There exists an element E in the group such that for every element A, we have that E times A is the same as A times E, which is A. Inverse elements. For every element A in the group, there exists an inverse element, B, such that A times B equals B times A, which is E, where E is the identity element. If you want to know more about this, you can check out our video on Galois theory that we linked in the description below. Also, do not forget to check the PDF link of all the calculations of this video that we put in the description below as well. Remember, the only way to actually learn math is by understanding each detail, each step, and then being able to reproduce it by yourself independently. Okay, let's get back to the video now. Gallo's work was revolutionary, but what was missing was a generalized framework to deal with different kinds of numbers and operations on them. Gallo's theory was just too limited to provide answers, so rings and fields were introduced. A ring combines two operations, usually addition and multiplication. Groups deal with one operation, either addition or multiplication. Rings use both, but with some specific rules. Additive abelian group. Within a ring, the addition operation must form an abelian group. This means that addition is associative, commutative, has an identity element, and each element must have an additive inverse. Multiplicative associativity. Multiplication in a ring doesn't need to be commutative, meaning that the elements can be multiplied in any order, but it must be associative. That means changing the groupings of multiplications doesn't change the outcome. Distributive property. Multiplication must distribute over addition from both the left and the right, ensuring that operations like factoring and expansion work similar to how they do with regular numbers. Let's take a matrix example. Addition. A plus B, in this case, is 3, 2, 4, 6. Multiplication, which is non-commutative. A times B is different than B times A. Distributive property. A times the sum B plus C is the same as A times B plus A times C. A field builds on a concept of a ring by requiring that multiplication, except by zero, also forms an abelian group. Fields are sets equipped with two operations, addition and multiplication, that abide by several rules. Both operations form abelian groups. For addition, it's the same as in a ring. For multiplication, every non-zero element has an inverse, and multiplication is commutative. Distributive properties, just as they were described in rings. Left distributivity and right distributivity. The set of rational numbers is a standard example of a field. Every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. For example, the inverse of 2 is 1 half. And the operations of addition and multiplication are both commutative and associative. And that's how we get to abstract algebra, which is basically an expansion of rings and fields. Consider the polynomial equation x to the power of 5 minus x to the power of 3 plus 2x squared minus x plus 3 equals 0. In the field of real numbers, or even rational numbers, solving such high degree polynomial equations exactly, or finding roots explicitly, is generally impossible using elementary algebraic methods, or even ring and field operations alone. Amy Noether is considered the mother of modern abstract algebra. She developed theories that clarify the structures of rings, fields, and algebra and introduce key concepts in the formulation of abstract algebra, such as Noetherian rings, which are fundamental in the study of algebraic structures. If you're curious to know more about abstract algebra and how it works, please leave us a comment below and check out this video right here. I'm pretty sure you're gonna like it. See you guys there.